Hello, amateur science community. Today, I'm going to be answering some questions about plant tissue culture. Before we get into it, my name is Lore, and I'm the host of Ants and Jars. Tissue culture is the process of cloning plants very rapidly, and it's actually not that hard to do at home. If you're interested in learning how to do tissue culture, I sell a starter kit on my website, plantsandjars.shop, which includes the chemicals that you need to make the tissue culture media, which is the gel that you see the plants multiplying on. I created a really in-depth tutorial for how to use the kit, so I'm also going to link that below. It's totally beginner friendly, so you don't need any prior experience. Also, the kit includes access to the Plants and Jars Protocol Library, which is a library of instructions for tissue culturing all sorts of different plants. Every plant is a little bit different, so the instructions are going to look different depending on what you're working with. And we also sell really cool tissue culture merch. Um, the shirt that I'm wearing now was just added to the shop last week. The front says Plants and Jars, and the back has an evil plant breaking out of a jar. Wear it while you do questionable things to your plants. Okay, so I asked for questions on Instagram and then I also pulled some from the comments as well. So even if you didn't want your comment to be featured in a video, here it is. Some of my favorite comments we got were good AI vid, hard to tell. You kind of sound like XQC. And I was looking for some cultivation tips. This is a little too much. Also, I had been asking my brother to comment the word Jarmy in the comments to try to make it catch on organically as a name that my community could refer to themselves as. So being the nice younger brother, he did. He said, I declare myself Lance Corporal of the Jarmy. And then he absolutely got flamed in the comments by this guy who said, and that's why you don't have a girlfriend. Okay, so the first actual question is, why is some variegation easy to tissue culture and some isn't? So variegation is the presence of multiple colors on a leaf, essentially. Uh, it can be caused by a virus, but most often when people say variegation in the hobby, they're referring to a naturally occurring mutation that causes these color changes. These mutations can show up in two ways. They can be encoded into every single cell of the plant, which makes the mutation stable and heritable, or these mutations can exist only in certain groups of cells within the plant, which creates something called a chimera, a plant made up of genetically different cell layers. In this case, the variegation pattern isn't always carried forward when you propagate the plant by tissue culture. Um, for plants with stable variegation, the color mutation pretty much stays consistent when you tissue culture these plants, the baby plants will reliably look a lot like the plant that you started with. But with chimeric variegation, it really depends on which group of cells regenerates during the TC process. Some of the baby plants can turn out completely green, some of the plants can turn out completely white, lacking chlorophyll, and then some other ones might just look like the original plant that you started with, which is ideally what you probably want. Fun fact, like the rare and expensive aeroids of Instagram, ball pythons can also be chimeric and have different cell lines uh, within the same snake. It's kind of like two snakes sewn together. Freaky. There's a few different forms of chimeric variegation and some are more stable than others. The stable types, are more likely to hold their variegation pattern in tissue culture than the more unstable forms of chimeric variegation, which often revert, resulting in either those all green or all white plants I just mentioned. Um, that's kind of why we don't see Monstera albos coming out of tissue culture. There are some, you can find them on Etsy and stuff, um, but those typically will go all green or all white. My mint monsteras love to go all white, so it just kind of depends on the stability of the variegation. And sometimes you don't know how stable it is until you put it into tissue culture, and that's just that. I actually have a full video script written where I go really into detail on the subject and talk about the cell layers and how that affects variegation in tissue culture. I've held off on filming that video just because I feel like it might be too sciencey. And when the videos get too sciencey, they don't do that well on YouTube. But if you're interested in it, let me know and maybe I'll film it. We need an episode on date palm cloning. Okay, believe it or not, this is the most common question that I get. Uh, date palms haunt my dreams. If this video gets 10,000 likes, I will tissue culture a date palm. 
there's no way. This person is asking glass jars versus plastic containers versus the little baggies. So this person's asking about vessels for growing tissue culture plants. Right off the bat, the baggies are never used for growing plants. Some labs, especially in Asia, use them for shipping plants. The plants are never grown in the bags. They're just for shipping. So I'm not really gonna consider that an option. Between disposable plastic containers and glass, I tend to prefer the plastic containers, as you can see by the wall of plastic containers behind me. They're a special type of plastic called polypropylene, so they can be autoclaved. Um, or pressure cooked to sterilize them, which is a necessary step in the tissue culture process. I get a little bit of flack from some people for using the plastic. They are single use, I don't reuse them. In a perfect world, I would prefer to use glass vessels that I could reuse and autoclave multiple times. However, I have a few reasons that is difficult for me to do. First is that even though I have access to gigantic autoclaves, I don't have an efficient way to autoclave lots and lots of glass containers at once. I would be limited to autoclaving like 24 at once probably. If you watched my Agri Starts video, they are a huge tissue culture lab and they have these custom built metal wire racks for stacking the jars yay high so that they can fit a ton of jars into the autoclave at once. They autoclave the jars with the tissue culture media already in them while I choose to pour it after. I just don't have anything like that and I don't really have the ability to like fabricate a custom wire rack right now. If you're curious as to what plastic containers I use, I have my Amazon storefront linked below which has all the plastic containers. The small ones tend to work better in a home pressure cooker the polypropylene doesn't warp at all when you stack the containers. The large ones are better if you have a flow hood and you can pour the media under the hood. The next question is, have you ever tried TC for carnivorous plants? Is it even possible? So yes, it is totally possible to tissue culture carnivorous plants. They actually grow pretty well in tissue culture, at least the ones that I have worked with which have been pingiculas and Venus flytraps for the most part. AG3 is a large tissue culture laboratory, also in Florida, where they grow tons and tons of carnivorous plants and then acclimate them and ship them out all over the place. I only recently got interested in carnivorous plants. The ones I showed at the beginning of the video are carnivorous plants. In the lab, where I'm sitting. We are testing out a lot of different carnivorous plant protocols as we speak. We also have some Nepenthe seeds growing. The media for carnivorous plants isn't that different to what I use for tropical plants. The main difference is that we reduce the MS or Mirashigi and Scooge basal salt concentration to one third. The reason that we reduce the salt concentration is because in the wild, carnivorous plants are growing in very nutrient poor environments. So the full salt concentration would just be way too much for them. Because they grow in these nutrient poor environments, that's the reason that they adapted to eating bugs and insects for extra nutrients. The main challenge I will say, having worked with some carnivorous plants over the past year is sterilizing them well enough to be established in tissue culture at the very beginning of the TC process. Before plants can go into the sterile culture medium, we typically clean them with bleach and then it goes into the media. The problem with carnivorous plants is that the leaves or whatever part of the plant we're using as our explant or tissue sample is often very dirty because they eat bugs. And also they're really sensitive so it's easy to over sterilize them and then they die in tissue culture before they can even grow. So they are challenging, but we're working on protocols. When we have some that we like, which I think we're really close actually, I will be adding some additional protocols to the protocol library. So if you already bought it, you'll have access to the new stuff too. I don't make you rebuy it, that would be crazy. The next question is, do you prefer vertical or horizontal laminar flow for TC and why? I've used both. My old flow hood was vertical. I actually just sold it last week. RIP to the old flow hood. But a vertical flow hood means that the clean air is blowing down at the work surface. My new flow hood, which is the one you've seen me using the past year, is horizontal, so the air blows at me. I think that the horizontal is easier to work with, and I've had some lower contamination rates with it, 
because you have a window of air between you and the culture containers versus with vertical when the air is blowing down. If you put your hand over the culture container, all the germs from your hand are just gonna blow down directly into your culture container. So you just have to be a lot more diligent with your sterile technique, whereas with the horizontal flow, you can be a little bit looser. So yeah, I find horizontal flow hoods a little bit more beginner friendly and easier to work with. However, <laughs> buy whatever's cheapest because flow hoods are so expensive and honestly both work. So get either, you'll be in a good spot. Would you share how you keep order in a spreadsheet? Yes, this isn't perfect, but this is what we've been using for the past year. I had a really ugly version of it and then my intern made it look better, so thank you. Basically, every plant is assigned a plant ID and we just go in order from 001. Then each batch of TC plants gets a batch ID. These are the two numbers that we print out and we put on the actual containers themselves. We make notes of when the plants were first initiated in culture as well as when they were last subcultured. Um, if it's been more than four weeks since the plant was last subcultured, the cell will turn red to indicate that we need to subculture it. And this is what informs us of what media we need to prepare for the week. We also keep track of the media formulations in another tab in the spreadsheet. That is secret, but the best ones are in the protocol library already. And then in the notes section, we try to keep track of the sterilization procedure that was used to initiate the explants. If a significant number of the cultures end up getting contaminated, then we know we really need to work on improving that sterilization procedure. This is another one I get a lot. What was the first plant you put into TC and what would you recommend to start TC with? And also what is the most rewarding plant to cultivate as a beginner? The first plants that I ever tissue cultured successfully were African violets. Although they lack excitement, they are really easy for beginners to work with and I highly recommend them. They tend to be really easy to sterilize, to initiate in tissue culture. Actually on the bottom shelf right there, those are all African violets and we had a 0% contamination rate when we put those leaf explants into culture, which is really, really good. The plants themselves also grow really fast in culture and um, they can also be grown without any plant growth regulators, which are plant hormones, so. They're super, super accessible for beginners. What happened to the moss TC? I've never done moss TC to the extent that I can remember, but someone in my Discord server has, and I wanted to share the photos because I hadn't really seen moss in vitro before. Moss is really cool. I think it was one of the first plants to ever exist on land. Uh, before I did plants in jars, I used to make these like prehistoric TikToks where I would put like art of prehistoric times and say, I want to go to there. And they would get like 50 million views, but I deleted my account, so I can't even show you guys. So I don't know, take my word for it. I would like to learn more about moss in general. I think I'm going to put non-vascular plants on my vision board for 2026. This is a boring question, but it's a really good question. So I included it. Doesn't IBA delete, doesn't IBA deplete when it is sterilized? I heard it starts to break down above 80 degrees Celsius. There are a number of studies on this actually for all different plant growth regulators. If you're watching this and you don't understand the question, IBA is a plant growth regulator or plant hormone, sometimes shortened to PGR, which are regularly used in tissue culture. We use hormones to dictate the way that the plant cells are multiplying and growing at different stages of the tissue culture process. When you're making tissue culture media and you want to include hormones, there are two options. The first option is to add the hormones prior to sterilizing the media in an autoclave or pressure cooker. Some people are concerned that the efficacy of the hormones is reduced when you autoclave them at high temperatures. So option two would be to filter sterilize them and add them after autoclaving through a filter syringe so that they're clean of any contamination, but before the media solidifies. So you kind of have a short window to be able to add them. I always do option one. I add the hormones to the media regardless of the type of hormone prior to sterilizing the media. In this study, they found that the IBA was actually fairly stable after autoclaving. They also compared it to IAA, another plant growth regulator, 
which became less stable after autoclaving. It looks like the study measured like 20% degradation of the IBA after autoclaving for 20 minutes. So basically, if you autoclaved one milligram of IBA for 20 minutes, it would be the equivalent of having 0.8 milligrams of IBA in your media. And this is sort of a hack, but I don't filter sterilize the IAA. I just add a little bit extra when I prepare the media to make up for the efficacy loss that it's going to experience in the autoclave under high pressure and high temperature. In a research setting, they would probably need to be a lot more exact than that, but for me, it works. There are studies for other plant growth regulators as well. In fact, BAP, Kinetin, 2IP, and Metatoplin all pretty much remain fairly stable after autoclaving. Okay, but this is like bubble boy syndrome. No, you have these plants in such incredibly sterile environments that when they aren't, will they have less hardiness to actually survive? Where's the studies that prove that tissue culture plants are just as strong and long lasting as regular grown propagations. So yeah, in tissue culture, plants are very fragile. Um, they have delicate root systems or sometimes no roots at all. And they also lack that glossy coating on their leaves that mature plants will have. Farina, I think it's called farina. Acclimation or hardening off is the final step in the tissue culture process. It's when you take the plants out of tissue culture and then you start to slowly reduce the humidity until they can survive in ambient temperatures so that we can welcome them into the real world. So the short answer is that once a plant is hardened off, it is just as strong as a plant that was propagated via taking a cutting. This person asked for the studies, so here are the studies. I think a lot of people are skeptical of tissue culture in the way that people are skeptical of things like GMOs or things that feel unknown or like how people used to be scared of pasteurized milk but now everyone's scared of raw milk tissue culture is good all right that was the last question for this q a i have a second one filmed which will be out soon ish actually i might save it for a few months but it's about the business side of tissue culture and selling plants and starting plants in jars and things like that questions that basically just didn't fit with the more sciencey questions of this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you want to do tissue culture, I feel like some of the topics we talked about today made it seem complicated. I swear it's not. It's really not that hard. I have the tutorial link below for the beginners and also a link to my website if you want to get started uh, and you're tissue culture curious. Bye.